we've already learned about linear perspective and all the different perspectives. So I just want to quickly recap or remind you of some of the things that were used before because we're going to go into a period in which actually one and two point perspe perspective were actually used. So for instance, in Giotto and uh, Cimabue's paintings, often they use overlapping and diminishing sizes. Often they use vertical perspective, which means putting one thing on top of another or diagonally, they do that, it creates space. <clears throat> Giotto, in particular, uses a lot of intuitive perspective, and he starts to intuitively understand about one-point linear perspective that we see where there are any kind of orthogonal or line that's supposed to be parallel to another line would actually be uh, converging at a point on the horizon. Two-point perspective, you have the corner of something facing you, and that you also have this idea that um, there are two points on the horizon line. Sort of in this painting by Gustav Kayabat that we looked at, we traced out the, the, um, the vanishing points in that, and it's very close to this diagram. You can see a horizon line and two vanishing points on that horizon line. And you can actually see how that building works. Now, when we looked at Giotto, he almost seems to understand two-point perspective. When you looked at this fresco before, we traced out some of the lines that were leading off of the buildings, and he has a size and scale differences and things like that. So when we traced out the lines, we saw that he didn't really quite understand where the horizon line was or, or where the vanishing points were. He just kind of understood that they needed to go to that general direction. And I corrected him. And you can see that here. So some of the other things that Giotto uh, does that's innovative is using light and shadow. So let's, let's compare his teacher to him for a second and just review some of the main ideas behind uh, Cimabue and Giotto. So if you look at the two panels, you'll see that, first of all, um, Giotto's anatomy is more convincing. You can actually see that there are figure, that there's a, a true anatomy underneath the drapery. There is a passage of light and shadow from the upper right-hand corner to the left-hand side, where the shadows in Giotto's painting are all on the left-hand side of the figures, where Chimabue doesn't have that. One of the other things that um, Giotto seems to do, which is uh, a little bit more convincing than Chimabue, is that he overlaps the figures, and um, some of the figures are hiding the figures behind them. The architecture of Giotto's sort of throne or framework makes a lot more sense, and you can actually see figures that are sort of peering through the architecture. So all of those things are combined to make Giotto a sort of better technician, a little bit better as a special effects man, where Chimabue is working in a more diagrammatic, almost doll-like forms, and it's a little bit more like, more like a cartoon. So Giotto paves the way for people who actually finally discover two-point perspective and one-point perspective. There seems to be a little bit of a, a debate about who actually invented or how perspective worked and, and uh, how it came about. Um, some of the main figures that you'll hear are, for instance, um, Leon Battista Alberti uh, and uh, Brunelleschi are some figures who are credited with at least uh, crystallizing and figuring out how linear perspective works during the Renaissance. I don't think that question is so important. I think that it was kind of an evolution and who knows who really invented it. But <clears throat> we can see that there are artists who actually use all of these things and combine perspectives together. And uh, this artist who unfortunately died probably uh, just after he completed this fresco, Masaccio, uh, which is a nickname which literally means uh, Clumsy Tom. He paints this fresco on the wall of a church. It's literally about 16 feet tall, maybe a little bit taller than that. And um, he uses a linear perspective, and he also uses a series of other perspectives that we sort of talked about when we were talking about Giotto. And um, the first thing that you can see is that he has, sort of has a humanistic or classical perspective because we have this classical architecture. And this classical architecture that we're seeing here is a Roman triumphal arch. Now, to put 
Jesus on a cross in the middle of a Roman triumphal arch is kind of a weird thing. And for the Renaissance people, they wouldn't have thought it was that odd of a thing. Um, but remember that triumphal arches were constructed around Rome when we studied the, the classical Roman era to uh, announce when an emperor would be coming back into town with spoils of war, like the Arch of Titus or um, uh, the Arch of Constantine, things like that. So by placing Jesus in the center of this uh Roman triumphal arch that has uh, Corinthian capitals on the pilasters on the left and the right hand side, and then Ionic uh, capitals um, on top of the uh, in the center. We're actually saying that Jesus is triumphant, and uh, we have God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus on the cross, and then we have Mary presenting her son, and inside the archway, and uh, St. John the Baptist, um, also, or actually St. John the Evangelist, excuse me, um, looking up at Jesus. Jesus has the body of a Greek god, which is sort of that idea of kalos that we studied before, where the inner beauty is manifested in the outer beauty. And then outside the uh, triumphal arches, we have the donors, and we don't know who those people actually are, um, but they are not worthy enough to be inside the arch with Jesus and with, uh, with the Trinity. And beneath that, we have a skeleton, um, and the skeleton, the inscription uh, above it says, what I am, you will become what I was, you are. So all of these things kind of tie in with all these different perspectives. For instance, um, the idea of a Neoplatonic uh, philosophy, that there's a better world in heaven. Uh, that's how they would have interpreted Platonism, and that an ideal world exists in heaven, but this one isn't so good. It's also a type of memento mori. It's a reminder of death, uh, because basically you're standing right where that skeleton is, and I'll explain how that kind of works. Uh, the figure of Jesus is idealized to look like a, like a Greek god, and then there's a sort of theological perspective. And the linear perspective ties all of this stuff together, even with a, a bit of illusionism. So, for instance, uh, they really liked playing with visual illusionism and special effects. And one of my favorite things to point out to students, because they always go ooh and ah when they see it, is that if you look at um, God the Father, he actually has a, um, a dove is the collar around his neck. That white shape is actually the shape of a bird. Then if you look above his head and above Jesus' head, remember that the halos used to be these sort of circles that would encircle their head as an aura of light. Now they're more like plates or elliptical shapes, almost like uh, ego waffles floating above their head. And because they're understanding uh, one point linear perspective, Masaccio kind of nails that. And so he's kind of showing you this. As we move down, we can see that there are coffers in the ceiling of that um, Roman triumphal arch that relate somewhat to the architecture of the Pantheon. And then the drapery that's on these figures makes a lot of sense and we can actually sort of trace the light coming from the upper right hand corner and moving across the figures especially in the uh, in the figure in the lower left hand side of one of the uh, patrons who is is kneeling and praying there if we move down we have the skeleton and that skeleton is is flanked by architecture that is of a classical variety So let's take a look at this in terms of linear perspective. Now, the diagram on the right-hand side, you can actually see that a normal human being would have been standing at this height. And uh, the person who made the diagram, I love this, is uh, actually emulating Leonardo's Vitruvian man that we'll be studying later on. So our eye would be, um, the horizon line would be right where the lintel is. And I'm going to point at it where this, this uh hard black line is. And if you were to trace the lines out of the coffers that we see in the ceiling, we can actually trace those out. And the vanishing point is in the center right at our eye line. So that places us beneath the donors on the left and the right hand sides and beneath Mary and John the Evangelist and beneath uh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit and God. So do you see how they're kind of um, focusing you with linear perspective that Jesus is in the center here?
and that everyone else is above us. Now, I also think that one of the interesting things is, do you see this white triangle I've drawn here? That they are placing the figures within this stable pyramidic form, and Leonardo will be doing that an awful lot later, that pyramids also draw your eye up to where the apex of the pyramid is, where this point is, and pull your eye up further and make you focus on God the Father. So what this has the um, sort of added benefit the linear perspective does is it actually ties in with your experience of the fresco, almost like it's a special effects or a virtual reality kind of thing, where you are standing beneath everyone else and it places you uh, both physically and emotionally and perceptually below the horizon line, below these heavenly figures. It also places the donors above you, so they're actually kind of saying something socially. And then it places... Um, God and and basically uh, the Trinity above everyone else and the framing device that focuses you on this and gives it a lot more authority and and uh, sort of a a sort of pedigree or history is the Roman triumphal arch around it. So we have all of these different kinds of perspectives being used to convince us. Um, and this is all they wouldn't needed convincing, but it's a way of actually just giving an extra punch uh, to the theological message. One of the things that I found on the internet when I was looking at it, uh, looking for these things is, people are really fascinated with the Masaccio's Trinity with donors. And you can see that this is a 3D reconstruction model that kind of gives you the sense of the space and the size of things. And I think that's kind of cool. And I found a couple more. I think all of these models kind of give us a sense of uh, the space that was being created, and the fact that this is one of the first times that we actually see uh, true one-point linear perspective being used um, in in a big fresco that actually gives us this sort of virtual reality point of view. Now, some of the things that Masaccio does to augment this or add to this is actually the use of light and shadow. We're going to be studying another uh, fresco um, of by Masaccio in a minute, and this is a little chunk of it, and it's actually a fresco called the Tribute Money. And we're zooming in on um, Peter actually paying the tax collector from Rome. But what I wanted to compare and contrast a little bit with this tax collector and uh, Peter is against this sphere on the left-hand side. And we've kind of discussed chiaroscuro, which is an Italian word that literally means light and shadow. And this diagram with the highlight, transitional tones, core of the shadow, and then this reflected light is a uh, really sh makes a circle have volume and cast shadows are fairly important too. So using value structure or shading to set forms off and to unify the whole picture and make it seem illusionistically like it makes a little bit more sense is a logical thing in what Masaccio does here. And um, we can see that there is a passage of light in the uh, in Masaccio's image. In the upper right hand corner we see uh, probably where the light source is coming because there are shadows on the left hand side and the drape is a wet drapery style, and even the heads are kind of spheres uh, that Masaccio is starting to understand light and shadow. And so Giotto started this, and he started intuitive perspective, and Masaccio kind of finishes the game by using all of these elements. So let's zoom in on another fresco of his called the Tribute Money. Now, in um, the Brancacci Chapel in Florence, in Santa Maria del Carmine, and so remember that Florence is often thought of as the birthplace of the, of the Renaissance, and that was one of the first lectures I gave you. In the upper left-hand corner, I'll point at it with my cursor here, you can see that there's a fresco that shows Adam and Eve being expelled from paradise. And so if we look, I have a detail of it here on the right-hand side of the image. We see um, the Archangel Michael, who is uh, pushing um, or escorting um, Adam and Eve out of the uh, the Garden of Eden, and uh, it's almost like there is this light or a black light or a voice coming behind them, yelling at them as they walk out. And uh, from a formal point of view, you can actually see some of the giornata, the uh, the sort of dark uh, outlining around each of the figures, especially around the figure of Adam here. We can see that there's a slightly different kind of uh, tonality in the fresco, and these figures even though they're in shame and being expelled, are walking out of uh, the Garden of Eden, and they have idealized almost perfect forms 
uh, and physical. So they represent, they are sort of our, the, the primal ancestor um, and they have beautiful bodies and they possess Kalos even though they were less than virtuous because they allowed themselves to be tempted. Um, some scholars have actually suggested that uh, the iconography of this expulsion scene has to do with the fact that um, Adam is truly repenting and he's ashamed and he's hiding his face because he feels bad about it. But Mary is just embarrassed because she's just hiding her breasts and her genitals. Um, I don't know how accurate that is, but that's one of the theories I came across. Now, also notice that there's a raking light and shadow on this, that there's that chiaroscuro. You can trace the light source in the upper right-hand corner and it moves across because there's shadows on the left-hand sides of the figure. <clears throat> now, the next panel that we're going to be looking at um, is actually this panel here that I'm pointing out, which actually is the tribute money. And that's probably a more significant panel, especially for the Renaissance, because it's sort of a, a discussion of the realms of heaven and earth and the roles of money in our culture, or at least in Renaissance culture. So let's take a look at that. The first thing that you need to uh, know is that it's sort of a combination of two chapters out of uh, out of Matthew, chapter 17 and chapter 22, and um, the the image itself is sort of a combination of those two stories. And basically, a paraphrase of it is that. Um, the first story is when they came to Capernaum, uh, the collectors of the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said, when he came to the house before he had time to speak, Jesus asked him, what is your opinion, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take tolls or census tax from their subjects or from foreigners? Um, when Simon said foreigners, Jesus said to him, then the subjects are exempt. But we may not offend them, so go to the sea, drop in a hook, and take the fish that comes up. Open its mouth, and you'll find a coin worth twice the temple tax. Give that to them for me, um, for me from you. Um, so basically, chapter 17 discusses the idea that Jesus is being quizzed, and people are asking him, do you have to pay taxes? And, um, and so... Jesus uses the analogy that basically um, you have to, uh, you, you, when you pay your taxes, you're living on the earth, you have to pay attention to the physical needs of this planet and, and of the uh, temporary or temporal world. And so, uh, but God will provide. All you have to do is ask God to provide, and that's part of the prayer. And so um, he tells Peter, just go down to the water and drop in a hook and, and pull out a fish. Chapter 22 is a little bit more complicated and, and is kind of similar to this. And I think that sometimes the two chapters are conflated together. So I'm going to give you the, the background on this. Chapter 22, basically the Pharisees who are trying to trick Jesus come up to him and say, um, Jesus, we know you're a truthful man and you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and you're not concerned with anyone's opinion and you don't regard a person's status. So tell us your opinion. Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? <clears throat> So as Jesus says, uh, um, he knows their malice. Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the, the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin, and he said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. And that he said to them, then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed and, not, and leaving him went away. So the basic idea here is that Jesus is saying, look at who's on the, on the coin and pay your taxes while you're on the earth. And these two chapters are sort of conflated together to tell the story. And I think that's really important because what it does is it divides the, um, the earthly realm and the heavenly realm in, in terms of a philosophy. And the stories are sort of combined here. So let's take a look at the fresco and, uh, and, look at some of the elements in it and I'll sort of bounce back and forth between some of these ideas. And so from a theological perspective, we are telling the story of Jesus. From a, a classical perspective, we can see, first of all, that um, they're all standing in contraposto pose, just like that figure of the Doryphorus that we studied earlier, that they're standing in a counterpose that looks a little bit more lifelike. 
we have um, this sort of echoing of the counterpose uh, in the in the center figure. We have uh, the tax collector in the in the middle of the picture with his hand out towards Jesus. In the far right hand corner, we've just sort of reversed the figure of the tax collector while Peter puts his coins in the hand. In the far left hand side, we see uh, Peter pulling the coins out of the uh, the fish's mouth down by the water. And in the center of the picture of Jesus, in the center of the picture, and he is flanked or surrounded by the apostles, and they all have those elliptical halos above their head because ja, um, because Masaccio was so enamored with perspective. Now, we also need to sort of trace the horizon line and the vanishing points and those kinds of things out uh, by looking at this picture. So I've done a little diagram for you to do this. And if you look at the diagram, I have the horizon line runs through all of their heads. And if you use the architecture to trace out where the vanishing point would be, we can actually trace the, the vanishing point all the way to right behind Jesus' head. The other thing that we discussed earlier in one of the lectures on uh, perspective was that there is this sort of lightening up and bluing out of the uh, of uh, for instance, things that are in the far background. And we call that sfumato or aerial perspective or atmospheric perspective. And I have this photograph here that kind of depicts that as well. And so all of these things tend to focus you on Jesus in the center of the picture. So the vanishing point is right behind Jesus's head. So linear perspectives is actually being used as a way to focus your attention on the main figure of Jesus. An interesting little element that I think is just a, a minor element is if you look in the lower right hand corner of the picture um, where I'm pointing with my cursor, the steps actually are in two point perspective and, they, and they're actually pretty well done. Now, there's a theological perspective that ties all of this stuff in together too. So, the first thing we need to see is that just like the Nicolo Pisano piece we looked at the Annunciation and the, uh, and the Nativity scene that was uh, from Pisa, this is a continuous narrative where the story is being told in three different sections all unified in one picture plane illusionistically. So what I'm talking about is we have the tax collector coming to Jesus. Jesus is pointing off with his finger here to Peter. Peter goes down to the water, pulls the coin out, and then the story is completed in the far right-hand side. Jesus is the center point of the picture and divides the picture into two planes. And there's a theological perspective in terms of dividing this up that has to do with an Augustinian interpretation. All right, so St. Augustine is actually this theologian who lived uh, around 354. Uh, we think that he was actually um, a black African, um, and he was a, one of the um, people who was a great philosopher in the church. And he wrote a series of treatises and books that actually have to do with the teachings and understanding um, uh, the books concerning uh, the New Testament and concerning of uh, religion. And one of the things that he comes up with is uh, in one of his books is the city of God. And he actually kind of outlines uh, a theological perspective in which he talks about what's called the city of God and the city of man. The city of God is a temporary place. Uh, I mean, the city of, of man is a temporary place, excuse me. And that's represented by the architecture on the right-hand side. And that's kind of what is being expressed in that Bible passage, because where you pay taxes when you live now, that's the city of man. We live in the world of man right now. It's temporary. It's temporal. It's not divine. It's not eternal. But the city of God goes on forever and is eternal and is like the planet and like the mountains that go on and stretch on and God will provide. So if you see that the way that Jesus is the center of this, he bisects the painting and um, on the right hand side is the architecture and where the taxes are being paid. And in the left hand side of the image is Peter down by the water and the mountains probably represent this eternity. And we even have this atmospheric perspective that makes it seem like it goes on and on and on. So this division between um, the sort of heavenly or ideal realm is kind of platonic in a way and has to do with the city of God and the city of man is temporary and the physical world. And we can look at this from a sort of platonic point of view. And there's another painting that expresses this sort of difference between the carnal and physical world and the, um, and the eternal world in uh, another painting that's uh, pretty much a contemporary of Masaccio.
This painter, Andrea Mantegna, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, shows Jesus reclining in a foreshortened uh, pose. And what I'm referring to as a foreshortened pose is Jesus' feet are in the foreground and come out and project towards us. And we can see his wounds in his hands and his feet, that stigmata that we were talking about. On the left-hand side, we have uh, uh, Mary leaning over over the uh, over his entombment. He has been deposed or taken down off the cross, and he's about to be entombed. And she's mourning over his death. Now, you can probably see that Jesus is a little bit um, uh, strange looking in terms of the foreshortening. And I found this student drawing of what uh, an actual foreshortened point of view would look like. And in foreshortening, things that are closer to you, uh, closer to the front of the picture plane, are considerably larger. So those feet are super big. And the person who's reading the book, their head is, is very small. And the book is very small in comparison to the feet that are projecting towards you. And Mantania doesn't choose to do that. And so let's address that first of all. If perspective by the 1500s is basically already in place and they really understand foreshortening the way this art student on the right hand side understood it, why aren't they doing it? Or why isn't Mantegna choosing to do that? And probably the reason for this is out of respect to the viewers, that if you make these feet in the face of the viewer, it's kind of a weird thing, and it focuses you on, on dirty feet that are projecting out towards you. So this distortion is probably um, done actually out of politeness to the viewer. Now, the other thing that you'll see about Jesus is that um, the drapery kind of outlines his genitals, and the genitals are a little bit exaggerated. And there's actually um, a scholar named Leo Steinberg who discusses this uh, in a book, I believe it's called The Sensuality of Christ, in which um, they wanted to show you that Jesus was fully equipped to be a carnal and physical human being. And um, so he it wasn't like he didn't have genitals, that he just didn't want to use them because he was more of a platonic and spiritual person. And he chooses not to be tempted by physical lust. And that's probably one of the, the reasons why that's done. The other thing that we see here is that Jesus possesses that sort of classical kalos. He is physically very beautiful. He's got a, a big muscles. Uh, he, his, his anatomy shows that of a, almost a Greek god. And that's a reference to um, humanistic and classical perspectives as well. Now, foreshortening is one of those things that's a little tougher, so let's take a look at a diagram. Remember how I mentioned to you that Leon Battista Alberti might have been one of the people who actually um, invented perspective? Well, at least in some ways he codified it, which means he wrote it down in a treatise. And um, later on in the 1530s, 1527, uh, a northern artist from Germany named Albrecht Durer takes Alberti's treatise and he outlines how it works. And so um, one of the things that Alberti suggested is um, that you can make devices that would allow you to portray things using, uh, you know, figuring out perspective and foreshortening in a better way. So this diagram on the top, this woodcut, was from one of his books. And it's a process called squaring up. And squaring up is basically what you do is you put a grid on a piece of paper, and we see that he, this artist has the grid. And you have this window that was referred to as Alberti's veil, which is either a piece of glass. Um, actually, they didn't really have that much glass that would be clear and that big. But it's actually a wire grid that corresponds to the grid on the paper. And what you would do with the, with the grid and with that obelisk he has in front of his eyes is you would keep your eye in one consistent place and you would look through that grid and you would draw what you see in each one of the squares. And that's called squaring up in today's parlance or today's language, but it's actually a way of portraying things. And what Alberti and Albrecht Durer are uh, attempting to show you is that it's kind of confusing to look at a figure that's foreshortened the way Mantegna did it. And so a good way of getting around some of the problems with this would be to use this veil to understand the size scale relationship and the, and the shift of size scale from the foreground to the background by using a series of grids. And there are several devices that have been invented. Albrecht uh, does another uh, instance of this with this uh, using a lute and a mandolin and, and using the same kind of window-like structure. Someone actually built a device in this diagram in the lower right-hand corner that emulates that. So all of this stuff ties together and gives us a sense that 
during the Renaissance, what they're trying to do is figure out how to use linear perspective to give you a better uh, experience and to convey the ideas more convincingly. And sometimes they have to modulate or alter these ideas a little bit um, in order to be respectful to the viewer and respectful to to God in their uh, in their point of view. And so what you need to do is uh, understand that a lot of times they use these special effects in the service of actually theology of, of, a, of a Christian message, even though they still believe that the classical past should be revived.